Actually, I'm just going to remember to silence my phone. So maybe silence yours if you have one. Um, welcome to our second panel of the seminar, um, which is uh, called Who Gets to Tell the Story? Public Narratives. Um, I, like Jeremy, I'm going to begin with some very quick introductions since you have them, just so you can match faces with biographies. And maybe I'll, I'll begin with um, the Bulgarians. Um, uh, we have, uh, to my left, um, Ivaila Alexandrova, um, who is a documentarian and the author of a documentary novel uh, called Hot Red in English, which was a winner of the Elias Kennedy National Literature Prize, among others. Immediately to my left, we have uh, Irina Nedeva, who is a journalist and documentary filmmaker uh, who works in broadcast media, both television and radio. Yes. yes. Um, we have uh, on my right Diana Ivanova, uh, who is a journalist, writer, director. You heard all this yesterday, but I'll refresh your memory. Um, who has written Traumas and Miracles, Portraits from Northwest Bulgaria, and uh, My Street Cuban Stories, How to Make a Bell, I've Lived Socialism, etc. Um, now let's see, for our Americans, uh, or semi-Americans, yeah, the Bulgarian, <laughs> adopted American, yeah, um, Demeter Kanarov, Right. Um, who is a freelance writer, photojournalist, contributing editor at the excellent journal uh, VQR, and has contributed to many other fine publications, and once lived on a sailboat in San Francisco. Yes. Yes. Um, Elif Bachiman, uh, who's the author of, uh, a staff writer for, New York Ma for the New Yorker magazine, and the author of two books, most recently, her novel The Idiot, Long in the Works, and prior to that, her um, collection of nonfiction narrative essays, uh, The Possessed, which I teach and I love. Um, uh, let's see, you met Philip uh, repeatedly yesterday. Um, so I will s simply add uh, one, th uh, I'm gonna pull out some details from his bio you may not have known. He was, um, in 2010, France made him a Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. Whoa. And um, if he's had at least one glass of something to drink, can recite romantic poetry by heart. Right. Okay, excellent. I'm Donovan Hone. Um, so uh, I want to be just begin briefly with some, uh, some, some, some quick remarks about our subject. I'm going to try to invite each one of our panelists to... Oh, I should remind myself and our panelists to speak at a translatable pace. Um, uh, I'm going to frame our, our discussion briefly, ask each of our participants to contribute some thoughts, but then I'm hoping there will be something of a free-for-all and let you bounce ideas off of one another. Um, the title of our panel, Who Gets to Tell the Story, Public Narratives, was handed to me. Um, so I was trying to decipher what the author of the title had in mind, because um, it wasn't immediately obvious um, to me public narratives. What is a public narrative? I think um, in the work of the panelists here, uh, we often see that it can be blurry, the boundary between the public and the private. But my sense is what we mean by this is not primarily memoir. Narratives that we had to go out and find, mostly by talking to other people. Um, who gets to tell the story? I think implied in that question, are matters ethical as well as aesthetic. Um, uh, because nonfiction, as is the case with ethnography, there's a long history that not all people get to tell the story. What gives a writer the authority to tell someone else's story can be a tricky uh, question to address. It's a little bit related to in fiction, the question of do writers, can writers in fiction inhabit other identities? But in nonfiction, there's the added dimension that the people we are writing about exist. Even if they're dead, they exist dead. So they're almost like ghosts haunting the story. And I know, certainly in my work, I'm aware of them and thinking about them. Um, I tend to hear 
to simplify uh, uh, too much, I, hear, I tend to hear two uh, opposing answers to this question of who gets to tell a narrative. Many writers will say, whoever can tell it well. I can tell any story, so long as I can tell it well. I sometimes hear from um, uh, students the opposite view, only the person who owns the story should tell the story. And I'm hoping that in our discussion we can move between those two uh, opposing, opposing views. I also want to separate quickly, I think there are two ways to think about who gets to tell a story. There's the telling, and then there's the writing. And those are somewhat distinct. Who gets to write a story and publish it, or if it's film, film it and produce it, is one question. But then who are the people whose stories we listen to as writers? That's another way of, of a question of whose stories end up being told. And often the writer is a kind of medium at a seance moving between the reader and the stories we're listening to. Um, so I don't think it's easy. I've asked our panelists to help me complicate this, and I've asked them to illustrate uh, with examples from their work where they had to wrestle with the questions of, of who gets to tell the story. Um, does anyone want to jump in, or I can point my finger? <laughs> Do you have something else? Point finger. Yeah. Point, finger. point finger? Yes, it's a sociological test. Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I didn't expect this because I was thinking you're going to some of the new people in the panels. But anyway, I, I, I had something in my mind from yesterday and it's kind of continuation of the um, discussion we had here in the panel and I think it's important continuation of this story because what uh, remained, and it's connected with your question, but what remained after the talk with Philip uh, yesterday was this... Um, um, t t truth Hills, like it was at one point, like said Truth Hills. And um, I was thinking after that, uh, but we have to collaborate, uh, elaborate on it, that Truth Hills, only if it's said again, especially when you talk about traumatic stories, only if it's told again in a safe place. Mm -hmm. We need a safety for the people who tell the story again, especially when they uh, have experienced some traumas. And this we can have examples from the therapy, for example. So in a trauma therapy, for example, you never ask the person to tell the story again before you feel you're sure it's safe for him. You, you take care of his own safety, of your own safety. And we have talks about this. That's why I'm talking about this now, because when we go to your question, who has the right to tell the story, I would tell uh, from my experience that I have the right only if I'm sure I give safety to the person and I can assure their safety to tell the story. And for example, I was working, um, uh, and what I mean with safety, maybe in journalism we do this feeling of safety through just being ourselves, being honest, and have our own sense of integrity. We know why we want this story. Because some Sometimes people, especially in traumatic uh, situations, they can tell us so many things that we are excited. Actually, violence is exciting, as also Philip was saying yesterday. But what we do with this, why we listen to it, and what we do with this story after we can, can we contain it? And if something in us tells us, I cannot contain this, maybe we should stop it, just for the safety of the, of the storytelling. So this is one point that I, I'm thinking is very important because uh, we, we are responsible to the victims. We are responsible because victims, and such a, so psychologically, it's more difficult for the victims to deal with the, what they have experienced as for the perpetrators. They have much more easy task to go on with their own life after that. And this is unfortunately true in all cases that I know and they have studied. And that's why I'm, I'm quite concerned, and I thought it yesterday, with how we tell stories of perpetrators, of victims, because in one case we have to protect the victims. When they hear again and again the stories, they can be again traumatized. We have to think about this. And this safety is something that I'm very much thinking about, because I think also in the case of, of, of Bulgaria and what I have uh, collected, we, we, we are 
we maybe have not been aware of this because people who went through trauma sometimes they lose the ability to talk mm -hmm. and the way they talk sometimes is kind of um, weird mm -hmm. and if we don't are aware of this we represent further this misrepresentation so the perpetrators talk in a good way and the victims actually cannot talk so they are victims they, they remain victims mm -hmm. So how we deal with this misrepresentation that's already because of the tragedy that happened, already somebody is a weak position and we cannot restore this position. He remains weak. This is for me the main question that when we tell a story, how we create this safety. And this safety has to, be, has to do with, with trust. And sometimes media can uh, uh, unfortunately distort it. <laughs> so this I like that you used the word responsible because that was a word that uh, Benjamin Moser used yesterday talking about Susan Sontag and I think is maybe a useful thing to think about, that we have a responsibility to the people who tell us stories. We have a responsibility to their stories. We have a responsibility to our readers, though, too, so sometimes those responsibilities may be intention. But are there other thoughts? Uh, I will uh, try to, uh, to give completely opposing perspective. I think that the story sometimes is much bigger than the people involved or the writer or the teller of the story. And uh, uh, especially maybe because of the journalism and because of the type of media I'm working for. Uh, yes, it's important to give the voice uh, to the people, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, really the essence of the storyline and the revealing of something that has not been existing before is much more important than just to voicing uh, uh, pain or emotions or trauma. And for me the biggest question is when the personal becomes uh, universal and uh, is it an effect uh, of um, a result of the uh, dramaturgy of uh, storytelling or, the, or it is really part of what make us involved in um, collective life. Um, and I will give just uh, three examples. First is when I tried to interview a political immigrant from Bulgaria who has been for the first part of his life a diplomat with the Kingdom of, Bul of Bulgaria during the Second World War and before. Later on, he decided to stay in France, in Paris, not to serve to the new Bulgarian government, government very much uh, constructed by the Soviet occupation, Soviet army here, and he became a journalist. Uh, he worked with Radio Free Europe first, then with uh, the founder of uh, Paris Match, this uh, uh, French magazine. Uh, and this uh, person was very interesting for me. I was just curious to know, because there was so much uh, going through his, um, in front of his eyes. Uh, he was a witness and he was involved in historical events for Bulgaria, being part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and many of the deals during, even deals with um, return of uh, land, um, the north part of Bulgaria was through his hands uh, in 1943, I think. Uh, so he was part of the history and later on he had to um, detach himself from uh, being part of a history. He became a mm, realistic journalist, uh, working with reality, but without playing in, in this reality a significant role. And I wanted him to tell the whole story of the 20th century through his eyes. And he was um, severely trying not to do this. Uh, he was 90 years old uh, with a brilliant uh, set of mind and uh, uh, memories and uh, very um, sensitive um, sense of good sense of humor. Self-irony was the prevailing emotion and he said, no, I'm not important. I, I never wanted to be important and I, uh, I'm just an, an ordinary human being. It was by accident everything. And I decided that Exactly this by accident is the most interesting thing is this in, in all his story. So I had somebody who was private, he wanted to stay private, and I wanted to to know more about him. I was 
incredibly curious because, for instance, maybe the m m main motivation for me was the fact that all these historical events around him uh, was very much connected with uh, his uh, incredible love stories, and he shared a secret lover with Roman Gary, who has been a very close friend to, to that to that person. So, someone who wanted to stay private, and somehow I forced him to, to go public. Uh, the second story is uh, about somebody who was uh, a wrong person in a wrong place, and because of this uh, accident, wrong things at the beginning, he uh, became a protagonist of an unknown story, completely unknown story, of how Coca-Cola entered Bulgaria during the Cold War. Uh, he, uh, he became part of an operation that is basically, that was been basically run by a, a holding of company, state company connected with the ex-secret services. Uh, the same company that was exporting weapons to uh, Algerian revolution, Kintex for the Bulgarian uh, audience, the same company started to um, import Coca-Cola uh, <laughs> the story is in 1968. So this person uh, came to to the focus of uh, the documentary because he was uh, he wanted to tell a story, and everybody was saying you are not important. There were other guys involved on the political level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, he wanted to self uh, mythology. Myth mythologize himself a little bit, but at the same time he had a pure sense of history. Uh, he collected all his documents. He, when the ex-secret services opened their archive, he was the one who went there, who took everything, and these were the documents that were not entirely making him a great hero. He even disclosed documents saying that he was used both by the secret services as a, uh, as an agent and uh, as somebody who has to be uh, followed. So he was in both roles in, during the time of this operation. Uh, and this story came to me because he wanted to tell. And he was a private private one, private human being who wanted to be, uh, his story to become public, so mm -hmm. the opposite. Because this act of storytelling is never innocent or simple. There's yeah, people innocent. have reasons to tell their stories yeah. or reasons not to tell them too. Yeah. Right? Other people? Go. За разлика от Диана, аз съм практик. Всичкото при мен, за това ще разказвам с конкретни факти върху моята книга. А, при мен нещата започнаха от радиото. Ние работим в една и съща институция. А, веднага след демократичните промени аз започнах една поредица възстановяване на историите на хора, които са интелектуалци, които са загинали в времето на Комунизма, идването на комунизма 44-45 година. Да. Да. Now, um, in contrast to uh, Diana, I'd rather uh, like to uh, speak as a, as a practitioner, uh, which is why I'd like to um, base whatever I have to say on the facts uh, surrounding my book, which are also at the basis of my book. And um, as a journalist working for the Bulgarian National Radio, actually, uh, um, uh, Irina, sorry, Irina and I, we work uh, um, for the same radio. Uh, right after the uh, changes, as we call them, or the revolution in 1989, I started a series of um, programs telling, bringing back to life the stories of Bulgarian intellectuals who were uh, killed during communist times. Започнах тази поредица и много бързо я спряха, забраниха я. Забраниха ми, това беше парадоксално, нямаше такъв случай. Забраниха ми да, да произнасям думичка по радиото. Аз можех да записвам хора, гласа ми се изрязваше, 
Минаваш от името на други хора, които водиха. Моето име не се споменаваше. И, и мене фактически ме нямаше. Аз изчезнах във времето, когато мисля, че беше най-творческото ми време. Да. Uh, well, par paradoxically enough, right after I started this series, uh, suddenly they were banned and the entire thing was banned and uh, there was a prohibition uh, on me uh, and my voice ever sounding on, on the radio. Um, I could interview people, I could record them, but my voice was always cut off from, from these interviews and from these recordings. It was never on air and actually I was made to completely disappear from, from these programs. Uh, and this happened in the years which I felt were the most creative years, the most creative time in my life. Точно тогава за коледа се обади една от героините на тези предавания. Тя беше емигрантка, живееше в Майнц. Каза, побързайте веднага, защото на мен не ми остава много време. Аз заминах, това беше 94-та година, тя започна и ми разказа своята история лична за своя убийца Прокрайко Алексиев. И след, седмица след като се завърнах, тя почина. Шегувахме се днес на обяд и аз казвах, че за разлика от всички вас тук, които присъствате, аз бях принудена да напиша тази книга. And it was at that time, actually around Christmas, um, Christmas in 1994, that I got a phone call from uh, actually one of the characters, I'd say probably one of the main characters in, in, in my book, uh, a Bulgarian uh, lady, um, an emigrant, uh, she was living in Mainz and uh, she called me and said that uh, she wanted me to go there immediately, as soon as possible, because she didn't have much time left, because she wanted to tell me her uh, personal story. And this personal story was actually about her husband, Raiko Alexiev, and uh, how he was killed. And uh, so I went there, and only uh, a week uh, following my return back to Sofia, she died. And actually, I was um, talking about this uh, today uh, over lunch, and I was joking that in contrast to probably all of you, I was forced to write this book. Разбира се, основния пласт на разказа беше разказа на тази госпожа. Към това добавих разказа, който имаше в досиетата на тези хора, архивите на Държавна сигурност, което беше плод на 9 годишно усилие. Едната брънка повличаше другата, поредният документ водеше към следващия и изведнъж, точно в този момент, почина моята майка и аз разбрах, че много важно е чрез смъртта да разказваш живота на, на другия човек. И тогава започнаха едни разкази с синовете на хората, за които, ставаше дума, които става дума в моята книга. Става дума за синове на жертви, синове на свидетели, синове на самите палачи. So it was the story of, of this woman that became uh, the, the basis, the backbone of, uh, of my book. And eventually to this, I added the stories of the other people who are there. Mostly they were uh, taken from the files of the former state security. And I worked with these for about nine years. And it so happened that one thing, one document left to another, uh, uh, led to another, and then to another, and, and things kept piling up. And it was about that time that mother, my mother died. And through her death, I realized how important it was to let 
uh, yourself talk about the life of others through the death that has befallen you. And with this in mind, I also started talking to the sons of the people that are mentioned in the book. These are the sons of the victims, but also of the witnesses and of the perpetrators themselves. Материал за страшително растеше, след това един критик я определи като книга, роман, документален роман, който е изграден на принципа на градината с разклоняващи се пътеки. And so the, the whole thing kept growing and growing and when eventually it came out, uh, one critic said that it was very much like a garden with so many uh, different paths that kept forking and forking and intersecting. За какво става дума? Между 44-та и 45-та година общия брой на безследно изчезналите и убитите в България с идването на комунизма е около 3000 души. Провеждат се серия от скълъпени дела. На 1 февруари 1945 година са осъдени и ликвидирани всички членове на миналите правителства, регенти, депутати, общо 140 души за които вечерта са убити на Софийските гробища, а след това ямите, в които са заровени, са разпродадени на частни лица, за да изчезне престъплението. Следва убийството на военния елит, на духовния елит, а моята книга се спира на ликвидирането в България на интелектуалния елит. So my book, my book actually tells about sorry uh, my book tells about uh, the time around 1944 45 uh, when the number of those uh, missing and those who were killed uh, by the by the new communist uh, authorities um, came up to three th over 3000 and um, for example um, those members, form, former members of the government, the regions, the MPs uh, who were killed in this way were 114. That was the result of uh, fake cases uh, that eventually ended up with death sentences for them. All these people were uh, killed in some faraway corner of the Sofia cemetery and then they were uh, buried in uh, mass graves uh, without any trace being left whatsoever and eventually uh, that part of the cemetery, that plot of land was uh, sold out to people, unsuspecting people who didn't know what was there and the same uh, happened uh, to the senior clergy and eventually the same fate uh, befell uh, Bulgarian intellectuals and it was exactly these intellectuals I'm telling about. През март 1945 година пред съда са изправени 105 български интелектуалци, 145 души свидетелстват против тях, Става дума за писатели, художници, журналисти, юристи. Главният обвинител е поет. Членовете на състава са също поети и писатели. And uh, so in March 1945, 105 uh, Bulgarian intellectuals were uh, brought before the court with 145 other Bulgarian intellectuals testifying against them. And these were all uh, writers, um, artists, uh, journalists, jurists, members of the legal profession, uh, with the key witness being a poet. Осъдени на смърт са 15 души, 10 на доживотен затвор, а като разтворих миналото се оказва, че това се е случвало и преди това. В 23-та, 25-та година са били ликвидирани други интелектуалци. 
And um, eventually, 15 of them were sentenced to death. Uh, other 10 were uh, sentenced to a lifetime in prison. And uh, when I looked back into historical records, I found out that the same thing had also happened before, uh, in between 1923-1925, when other Bulgarian uh, intellectuals were annihilated in this way. Обществото се проявяваше едно и също нещо. Циклично в България са, са убивали мислещите хора. Доктрините отключват тези цикли на репресии. Ужасяващо е как идеологията превръща омразата в норма. It, it turned out that it was exactly at times of crisis when such uh, cyclical elimination of intellectual of all thinking people in the nation occurred and it turns out that doctrine is what triggers such cycles of, uh, of repression. Actually, ideology is what brings forward this hatred. Потрисащо е поведението на български интелектуалци, защото спирам, за да дам думата вече на другите, може би ви отекчих, но потрисащо беше участието на български интелектуалци в чистките, например, един писател, художник, карикатурист, Грън Кюлявков. Любимото му Любимо му е било да присъства на разпитите в дирекция на милицията и да вижда как измъчват хора, разпалва се печката, нагрява се и слагат хора върху нея. След убийството на Райко Алексиев, той е нахлувал с други интелектуалци в дома му и са разграбвали вещи, виждали са го скъфявото кожено пълто на Райко Алексиев а, да, да върви Софийските улици. Uh, and uh, what is what I find shocking, and uh, and with this I'm, I'm I'm coming to the end of what I intended to say. What I sh find shocking is uh, how ardent intellectuals were in uh, being involved, taking part in these uh, pur purges. And uh, for example, there was this uh, writer and um, artist and intellectual Krumkulavkov, and this is just a single case in point. Um, who was very fond of um, being present at um, torture while the interrogations were going on and the interrogated were tortured by uh, the militia, which is how the, the police was, was, was renamed back then. So he would go to the interrogation room and take pleasure in watching how the uh, stove was heated up and how those who were interrogated were placed. On, on, on the hot stove. And it was the same person who eventually, uh, together with other intellectuals, um, would go to, to the home of Raiko Alexiev, that same uh, artist who was murdered, who was one of the victims, and together they would literally plunder the, the home and uh, eventually he was seen walking the streets of Sofia wearing Raiko Alexiev, uh, Alexiev's uh, well-known uh, brown coat. Вчера господин Горевич говореше за една своя героиня, която е казвала, че трябва да оставим историята в покой. Мисля, че тези истории не бива да се забравят, защото това е много важен човешки опит. Има една книга Безсъдбовност на Имре Кертес, който стои в концентрационния... Безсъдбовност. В която той гледа раните си, от които изпълзяват черви и казва, не можеш ли да почакат малко. Така индиферентно струва ми се е българското общество в 
към травмите на своето минало комунистическо. И аз се надявам, че последователната практика на помненето може да замени удобното забравене. Mr. Gurevich was telling us uh, yesterday about uh, one one of the people in, in his book about this uh, woman uh, who um, eventually tells him that uh, she wants to uh, leave this history, all these memories uh, aside at rest. But in this case, I think that this part of history should not be uh, left to rest, should not be uh, left aside, because, I don't know, there is this book by Imre Kertes. It is called, I'm not sure about the English translation of the title, but uh, Faithlessness. And in this book, he uh, now writes about the open wounds and about the tiny worms coming out of them. And he says, um, they should have waited before doing this. So this very much reminds me of how indifferent uh, we Bulgarians are um, toward our history. And we shouldn't l let this indifference continue. We should keep remembering and bringing these memories to life again and again, because we shouldn't be left indifferent. makes me wonder if this question uh, is has different um, complexities if we're thinking of for American writers versus Bulgarian writers, for American readers or Bulgarian readers. Um, I wonder, Demeter, since you've worked between the two countries, if you have any thoughts. Thank you. I, uh, I'll cheer you up with a, with, with a war story. Um, it's um, uh, actually uh, most of my reporting uh, I do here around the Balkans where I speak the languages or I understand the languages and sort of think that I sort of get the culture. But in 2010, uh, I sort of decided to venture out of my um, comfort zone a little bit. So I went to Iraq and I was um, uh, an embedded journalist with the US Army there. And so, just to give you a quick background, uh, the embed program that the, that the U.S. military started, um, um, you know, its purpose was to basically send uh, journalists together with the army to cover the army site. Uh, the, the program was started by the Defense Department um, by Donald Trump, so sometime, I think, in 2002. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, basically, the way for, a, you know, as, as, as a freelancer, I couldn't afford, obviously, to go to Iraq to afford a fixer, to, to afford a translator, um, to afford security. Uh, it was very difficult. So uh, what I did was I applied to be an embed. I, I you know, sent my application to the Defense Department, and they approved it. Um, I had met some people actually in Kosovo, some US military personnel, and that's how the whole connection happened. But um, so I had some misgivings about it at first. and. Um, and uh, when I went there, basically, uh, the story, uh, I was doing a story for Esquire magazine, and uh, the story that I was doing was how the U.S. military was preparing the Iraqi police to take over security once, once, the, um, once the U.S. military forces leave Iraq. Uh, so that was sort of the, the, the center of the story. But I ended up, you know, as an embed, I spending, ended up spending a lot of time on the military base, and basically the only... And, and I wasn't really so interested in covering sort of the, you know, the soldiers there, or I was really interested in the Iraqis. I was just curious what's happening, and I, was, I just wanted to, to get to see more of that world. But once you're an embed, you get to see only one side of the story, right? So you don't get to go and, and, and actually talk to the Iraqis openly. And plus, you know, there was the language issues. I don't speak Arabic, so everything was done through, through interpreters. And so, and so I was having this sort of ethical dilemma whether any kind of reporting that I do there is, you know, worth it. I mean, I was looking at the world through, you know, Philip was talking yesterday about the pains and pains and pains of, of, of sort of, of language and of interpretation and of all that, that that come between the journalist and the world. And I was looking through, a, you know, a, a five-inch glass of, a, of, a, of, a, of an armored vehicle, you know, an MRAP. And I was looking at this world through that armored, armored window, 
and I would be talking to the Iraqis in full, you know, armor, you know, sort of body armor. And I was even thinking, you know, when we do the salam alaikum, I'm just touching, not my heart, I'm touching the body armor, you know. And, and somehow this, this sort of great divide between, between the reporter and the world he is supposed or she is supposed to report on just struck me as just absolutely ridiculous. And, 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 you, know, it, and, and, and you know, I finally did the story. It was, um, you know, through a lot of edits because Esquire also wanted me to do like man goes to war, you know, kind of story. <laughs> and I wasn't comfortable with that story either, you know. I actually like to do the more human kind of story, a little bit more poetic even somehow. Uh, but but anyhow, it, 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 um, the story was done, but, but it, it sort of taught me that um, I should be very careful when I try to sort of go and parachute somewhere in, in other places and, you know, where, where I'm limited by, by so many circumstances on, on, you know, what to report on and what to do and, and the language and so on and so forth. So, so I think it's wonderful actually to be, you know, a, you know, a freelancer in a place like that, but also the, the dangers are so many that you have to have all these restrictions. Anyway, it's, it's one of the dilemmas that I've, I've faced, and, 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 and so um, it's, it's something that I always keep in mind. Yeah, um, my, my first experience, uh, so, the, so the general question of who gets to, who gets to write and the ethical issue of um, impinging on other stories when you try to tell your own story is something that's been extremely painful for me uh, and, and difficult in my life. Uh, it actually caused me um, a sort of a block issue around 2014 when I had gone back to New York after being in Turkey for a while. Um, so I, uh, I had a contract for a book that I was not able to write um, because of these concerns. Uh, and um, so I did what people do in New York and I went to therapy. <laughs> and uh, there I, you know, talking about why I write and why I had this job that I had, um, one of my earliest memories is my mother telling me when she would do something wrong. Um, so she was, she was a, an immigrant from Turkey. She was working as a doctor. She was quite young when she had me. She was a medical resident. So it was not easy. She got very sick. Um, and she was working full time at the hospital. And she would forget things, like she would forget to pick me up from school. And whenever she would do that, she would say, don't put this in your novel someday. So I, I grew up with this idea that a bad thing that you can do to someone is to put them in your novel. Um, and it came true. It, <laughs> um, it's the first time I, uh, I really did reporting about real people was when I was 20 years old. So it was uh, exactly 20 years ago in the summer. Uh, I was at college at Harvard where I worked very hard to get in to please my mother because it was very important to her that I should do that. Um, what I've realized is that a lot of becoming a writer was about telling a story about myself that was different from the story that my mother was telling me. And that is something that caused a great deal of pain to my mother. Yeah. Yeah, I realized that... Um, one of the things that made me want to become a writer was the necessity of telling a story about myself that was different from the story that my mother told about herself, which was a story in which I was kind of an accessory who was causing her various problems, some of which were funny, some of which were sad, but they were her problems. And um, I think that's the case actually with a lot of writers, that they're, they're telling a story to correct kind of a power imbalance. So what Diana was saying, um, and Demeter and, and other respondents really resonated with me that there's a basic trauma that you, even if you're not writing about traumatized people, um, you come into the situation with this power imbalance and some part of why you wanted to become a writer was to correct that and yet you can't quite correct it because you're still inside it. Like you know, Demeter said, you're hitting the, the body armor. Um, and then just one more anecdote that I wanted to say was the first reporting work that I did was um, I was at Harvard and uh, they had a student travel guide where they would send students to different countries where horrible things happened to them. Everyone got mugged or you know, raped or fell down a hole. It was like, it was a complete fiasco. I think I, those books don't exist anymore. But they, they sent me to Turkey. And so I was 20 years old 
And you might be surprised when you see how sort of soigné and articulate I am now, but at that point, I was, I was a particularly goofy and unprofessional 20-year-old. And my clothes were very peculiar. I spoke Turkish with an American accent. I looked extremely young. I looked even younger than I was, which was quite young. And I would get off these buses in central Anatolia, and these just hordes of Anatolian men would fall on top of me and be like, come to my hotel, write about my hotel, write about my restaurant. Because they knew about this book. They found out my itinerary somehow. So there would just be these hordes of men waiting there. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if I can slow down. You might have to keep up. <laughs> All right, you try to keep up. Um, so I would, I would get off these, these buses and, um, yeah, and be confronted with this power imbalance, which was extremely um, difficult and, and painful. I would, I would get lectured a lot by men. Um, people would assume that I was very stupid, which, you know, I was clueless about a lot of things, but I wasn't stupid. And the whole time they would be talking to me, I would be thinking, well, I'm going to go and write my version of it but it, put, it puts you in a false position. And, and when, I, when I got older in my 30s and I went to Turkey and I was reporting for The New Yorker, the situation was different. It's not like I'm writing a hotel review that's going to determine whether people go to this guy's hotel or another guy's hotel. But they're still very conscious. A lot of the people who I was writing about, they know that they, maybe they don't know The New Yorker, but they know that it's a big magazine in America. They know America is a big deal. They think it really affects them, and this power imbalance would, um, yeah, constantly be on my mind and was was a source of great discomfort. I'll stop there. Dude, I, yeah, uh, a writer friend of mine has a line he uses when he's reporting that I've now adopted, which is he he tells people, "I'm not going to tell your story. I'm going to tell a story," uh, because I think it sometimes. That's one of the reasons people tell you a story. They imagine it's going to appear in print exactly as they've dreamed it would. And of course, we change stories to tell, to tell them in the ways we need to. Philip. Well, I mean, on the general broad question here of who gets to tell the story, I mean, it, I'm pretty, I feel like one, we all get to tell the stories. And, uh, and, and, and it's very rare that like, it shouldn't be that anybody gets to tell the story at the expense of somebody else telling the story, but many people are never going to be able to tell their stories, mm -hmm. uh, may or may not wish to, as has been mentioned here. Um, and as we know all too well, many people who wish to are incapable of it either by virtue of uh, their circumstances and their social position and their power balance and also incapable of it in terms of their talent. Um, I mean, not everybody can tell their story very well. Um, some people can tell their story to a writer pretty well and that writer can then tell that story beyond. So there, there are ways in which telling other people's stories is not simply appropriation, but can often be uh, an actual collaboration or an assistance or a sort of you know, amplification of that position. But I also want to turn it upside down for a second in the power balance thing and say, um, when you were telling the story about the embed, my experience as an embed was only covering the John Kerry presidential campaign. And, 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 you, and the way it works in America, if you're a campaign reporter, is you arrive at this place, you get up in the morning in a hotel that's been assigned by the campaign. You get on the bus. The bus takes you to the venue, the venue being some place that the person's going to give a rally. And then you put all your gear in front of you and s sniffer dogs come and then Secret Service guys come and they wand you, and then you are now scrubbed, right? And you can no longer speak to the public, right? You now have to go into the press pit, which they supply with all the things press need, food and Wi-Fi. And, and, and you sit in there, and the second you get there, all the traveling press corps sits down, they flip over their computers, and, they, and you're like, what happened? I mean, they, they start filing stories. It's totally bizarre. And then this guy gets up and gives a speech and you try to lean over the thing and talk to the other people. Now at Trump, he turned it around. You also got spat at and thrown stuff at and yelled at and he would point to the press and then everybody would go, Rah. But it, it was totally bizarre. It made no sense, especially as this whole democratic exercise of a free press, et cetera. The only way to cover the campaign was to leave the campaign. Um, and also, so you, you sort of think, who gets to tell the story? 
do we want our political leaders to be the ones who get to tell their stories? If we believe that only the person whose story it is can tell the story, what does that mean when you write about public figures at all? We all disagree with that, mm -hmm. right? We all think that our job is to keep the bastards honest at least a little bit, or at least try to get at what they're not telling. And when you say that only certain people can tell the story that they own, well, do they really, I mean, where does our ownership overlap, whatever that ownership means? And also, why shouldn't we be thinking about which parts aren't being told? And I think in some ways the best example of, in a way, both sides of this is, is, the, is Chinua Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, which of course is considered like the, the first great sort of universally recognized as a great novel, African novel. Um, but it's also, it's a very specific novel about Igbo experience in, in Nigeria during the period of colonization. And it's this very intense story about local customs and of struggle and a, a tra it's, a, it's a sort of Greek tragedy about a, a man. And at the very end, this colonial official appears. And the story that you've just read as a novel, he comes at the very end of it, understands an account of it, and says he was very glad to have heard this story and he thought it would make a terrific uh, like coda or last couple of lines for his study, the pacification of the people of the lower Niger Delta, <laughs> period, end of book. And for a man who had made his whole purpose to say we have our account of ourselves, we existed and have our own stories and must be heard and so forth, which this book did, he also acknowledged this other version, which probably in the very long view, I don't think he'd say that guy shouldn't, he wasn't saying that guy shouldn't tell a story. He's saying that shouldn't be our idea of our own story. I'm telling this to us about us. That's part of our story, is that that other account was told. You know? And, and so it's got the both sides of it in there. But I, I just am very wary of sort of the idea that there's some category of humanity that, or, I think people's very private stories, sure. Those are theirs to tell or theirs to decide that other people shouldn't necessarily know. It's because nobody else knows them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you can't get them from them unless they volunteer them. And I think one has to be very respectful of, I'm, I think, of people's privacy and not sort of, I am a journalist. Mm -hmm. But I experienced this also with, I mean, you get the other side, which is people who come and, and sort of say, will you tell our story? I, I, the very first long narrative journalist project I did was in 94, I went to do uh, Vietnamese boat people who were remaining in the camps around the perimeter of the South China Sea. So I was in this little island of Palawan, way off the southern end of the Philippine archipelago, and there was this camp where these people had been shut in for 10 years in total limbo. Like the resettlement program had ended, and repatriation had not yet reached them, and I came and they they would, come, they would sneak out to come to my hotel. I got word into the camp because I wasn't allowed in. And they would show up and they'd be like, we are so glad that you have come to rise up for us and tell our story, to rise up our voice and tell our story. And, and then it was like, we hear you are a lawyer who can adjudicate our case. That was like by day, end of the first day. By the middle of the second day, somebody came and said, at last a US senator is before us. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta get out of here, you know? And, uh, I moved across town, I changed hotels, I got the word out differently. And, and you could tell them all the time, I'm not here to do that. I'm gonna do you no good. Don't get in trouble, which some of them did, for sneaking out of the camp on, to me because I'm going to do you any good. What I'm doing and what you need may not in any way overlap. And I think if one finds ways to be honest about that, at the same time as to say, your story should be told if you wish it to be, uh, you, can, you can manage that. Since it's um, 4.30 and we're, uh, uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be some sort of commentary. Uh, I want to uh, open, uh, I have questions, but uh, rather than ask mine, I, I want to test the room and see if there are questions you would like to ask our panel. Yeah, for Philip. I'll repeat it aloud. Oh, oh, great, we have a mic. Um, speaking of um, what you do or how what you do serves or doesn't the people that you write about, what was your rationale going into the whole Rwanda thing and what do you tell them when they want to know 
how what you do are going to affect them. I say it probably won't. And they're okay with that, and that's it. If I'm talking to a private person, and along the way they say, you know that thing I said earlier, I'd like you not to maybe use my name with it or something, because they suddenly realize what's going on. A public figure says that a little while later or calls you two days later because something happened in the world. No, that's their job to figure that out. I mean, that's my job then to decide, but I might say no. The important thing you said to me is the important thing you said to me. I'll put it in context. Um, but we had a tape recorder, and. I was depressed. So, so it's very different. But very few people in Rwanda asked me. <laughs> I, which was... Do, don't know. they have the same hope that what you will write will eventually lead to anything Yeah, better but they them? don't have changes? an idea that it will have a direct consequence. In other words, it, and, and most people don't. That's much more reasonable to think inside your own country. So if I'm doing a piece in America about a situation somewhere in America, even if it's about... Uh, I don't know, mine workers somewhere who don't get a lot of national attention, their reasonable expectation would be, this is national attention, right? People will hear me, including the people who control the circumstances around my fate. That's different. If, if I write about a mining situation in, in Rwanda, the most likely hope would be that like the mine owners who live in New York are going to hear about it. That's it. I mean, they, they wouldn't be that way. It's, 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 it's just very, they have a different relationship to it. They know they don't know who you are, but they want to talk. So doesn't the question come up, just, the, just this last one, doesn't the question come up on their behalf? So why, do you, why are you doing this story at all? No, as I say, many people don't ask. They don't say story. They, don't, they, are, they know you are investigating or... Try, I just say I'm trying to understand what happened here and I write. That's what I say. I say, I'm trying to understand what happened here, and I write, and what can you tell me? You know, then we talk about it. But, no, if somebody says, I don't want to talk to you, or why would I tell you something, or you probably work for the government, or you're going to tell somebody, I mean, I'd say, well, then this isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, Elizabeth. Um, I have a question for Demita. I'm wondering if you could share with us in what ways these issues have come up, if they have, in your work as you work on your biography of Georgi Markov, and maybe, um, you, maybe you could share very briefly who he was for some of our uh, visiting audience. But I'm just wondering if, um, if there have been issues in that, in working on that research and writing where you have found yourself torn between public and private narratives or senses of responsibility? Yeah, well, that's, that's a, a big question, and, and it's probably going to take quite a while to explain the, the project of the biography. But, you know, just briefly, Georgi Markov was um, a person, a Bulgarian writer, very famous in the 1960s, close to, uh, to the Communist Party, uh, one of the most uh, lauded Bulgarian writers. Um, of the 1960s, and he ended up defecting from Bulgaria and working for some of the big radio stations uh, in, uh, in Germany, Radio Free Europe, uh, Deutsche Welle, uh, the BBC. He lived in London uh, for, um, in, throughout the 70s, and then he became such a threat to the regime that basically in 1978, uh, together with the KGB, the Bulgarian state security, deci decided to assassinate him in this absolutely lurid fashion. Uh, with what they call the umbrella murder, you know, with this poisonous pellet. Uh, so, and, and anyhow, uh, a lot of the narratives surround this murder and kind of, you know, the murder itself only, and, and they, they completely dismiss his life, you know. I, all people want to know is the, the murder and how it was done and sort of the James Bond style of it. And, and so I decided that it's an important thing to tell, actually, the, the backstory, to, to go back and to, to understand how... A person, you know, because we have these very, um, very um, uh, sim simplistic narratives about like dissidents or about people who are, people who are uh, in power. But he was, you know, he was part of the system in a certain way. So, and he turned against it. You know, he sort of wrote these narratives from inside the palace. I mean, that's that's why he was dangerous, not because you know he was somewhere, some dude who, who sort of was criticizing the government. He was inside the government 
sort of, so to, so to speak, and he, he was, you know, an important member of the writer's union, and he ended up defecting and knowing all of these secrets, and all of these, like, private lives of people, and sort of how the system operated. So, um, so uh, I wanted to tell a complicated story, not just of a dissident who's, who is opposing a totalitarian regime, but how, you know, how we're complicit sometimes, and how do we change at all? How, how do these changes happen? And, and sort of the, the, you know, the sort of the variegated life of this person was, was absolutely fascinating to me. And, and since, you know, the family ended up, after I did this big piece for the nation, the family ended up giving me, you know, giving me access to, fa to papers and to letters and stuff like that. But, you know, there are the dilemmas as every biographer faces, you know, you know, how much of the private life do you reveal? What's the, where does the line between private and public lie? And of course, so many people tell me different narratives, right? Because people who are, who were part of the regime, they try to, by criticizing him, they try to defend also their own actions or, or their own, you know, continuing complicity with the regime for, for a longer period. Others, you know, have their own agenda. Everybody's got a spin, mm -hmm. you know? And that's how, as a journalist, you have to hear hundreds of stories in order to get beyond the spin. And I think that's true of, of Markov, that's true of any, any story, even environmental stories that I've done. You know, I'm sort of on the side of the environmentalists, so to speak, you know, I mean, I, I care about nature, but then you know that they're giving you a certain spin as well. And, and the mining company is giving a spin. So, so you have to navigate very carefully between these, these things, everybody's got an agenda. So, so I think it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter whether it's the project is biography or just a feature story or, you know, what the subject is. Uh, I think a journalist is always sort of, you know, between the skilla and the charybdis of, you know, one and the other. You, you just have to, you have to make your own mind about things. And and the more information, you never get to the truth, but at least you get to like understand its multiplicity and to sort of navigate, uh, you know, more safely toward what may be an approximation of it. Other questions? Yeah. I have an answer for you, Donovan, actually. Can I tell the story of the title? Yes. Okay. Yes, tell the story of the title. So, which I threw at you without explanation, and it actually doesn't have to do with literature. Maybe some of you know um, the Whitney Biennial. Mm -hmm. It's the biennial that the critics love to hate, really. So this year, for the first time, I only heard praises until uh, some artists wrote this huge article and actually demanded that the curators will dismantle a painting. And the painting was about an uh, Afro-American boy who was killed in the 50s because this white lady accused him of being mm. seducing her. So, Emmett Till? Was it Emmett Till? Yeah. Her people, you know the story, right. So the problem was that this very dramatic, uh, traumatic um, story involving black kids mm -hmm. uh, was painted by a white painter. And this made me think, I, 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 this made me think about these mm -hmm. narratives and it's bigger than literature and uh, I think it has to do with shifting paradigms and values in the time that we we leave now. So. And, I, and I worry I set up a straw man in saying that there are those who say only the person who owns the story gets to tell the story because I think that's easy to complicate. Um, and I think it's a real, I think that's, I think, and, and actually Philip was talking to me the other day about the difference between writing um, about a race in Rwanda versus a place like South Africa that it functions very differently and you have to make different calculations. I know I've been reluctant at times to do stories in Detroit if I felt like there were too many layers of Kevlar, so to speak, between me and, and the communities I was entering as an outsider. Um, so I think there are, there are gen, genuine uh, uh, ethical uh, challenges when we're crossing those kind of boundaries. Certainly in America, the, the race is probably the, the big one. But the other thought? Yeah. I mean, look at Catherine Boo's work. Um, Catherine Boo's? Do you know, you know Catherine Boo? Catherine Boo is a, she also writes for The New Yorker. She started out at The Washington Post. and. You know, she does these deep immersions in communities that are not her own. She's a small white woman, mm -hmm. uh, quite frail physically. She's had illnesses, and that's visible. Um, and she did a, I don't know how many years it was, but she spent about three or four years in an Indian, Five. like spending almost every day in this Indian slum of Andawan um, alongside the Bombay uh, airport. 
and wrote a very uh, closely reported, almost sort of novelistic in the sense that it really, there is no narrator perspective at all, um, about this community of garbage pickers who live in this extremely uh, tenuous position in extreme poverty there, who are totally, in other words, foreign to her. Mm -hmm. And she also has written about poverty in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., in the black communities in Washington, D.C., in a way that, you know, she spends years, she, spends, she gets mm -hmm. to know people very well, she, gets to, she lives inside people's lives. She never, she says in her entire reporting career, has spoken to an official source mm -hmm. about anything. Mm -hmm. and, she tell, and she writes about policy, but by looking at what lives are like. Nobody says, I mean, I'm sure some people say, well, what's she doing telling this Indian story? But ultimately, the, the quality of the mm -hmm. proximity and, and so forth just is the answer to enough mm -hmm. people about that. So it's not just who, but how. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yeah. I, I just wanted to give one practical example about this difficulty of telling a story and who has to tell a story uh, and to make more clear what it means, safety. For the, that we have to protect. Um, so I'm uh, collecting now, I'm working on a project, I'm collecting stories of children whose parents have been part of the communist secret services. And um, one woman wa came to me, uh, she knew that I'm doing this, and she came to, a, she wanted to talk very much to me and to tell a story. Just to, that I want that to tell you this because it's a very complex issue to see how complex it becomes when it's, we come to the next generation. Uh, and uh, she came to a small group that we were meeting and um, in short, the story is like this. I'm just saying it very simple. So her father was a village teacher who went to work as a policeman and then in the state security for money, just to receive more money. It was in the end of the 80s. So it was very close before the changes. So the changes in Bulgaria are coming, 89, and he remains in the state security apparatus working further in a provincial town in Bulgaria. And then he becomes a very important person in the so-called anti-mafia operations, because in Bulgaria it starts a big struggle with new criminal um, groups and mafia. And in this one of these cases, uh, this local mafia, which is in another part of Bulgaria, want from him to appoint a special person in the state security apparatus in the, mil in the, in the police in order to protect the operations. He doesn't allow this to happen. The daughter is a student in a university and she's being, um, um, they take her, so as, as a kid they kidnap her and they put her in a channel for prostitution. So this, uh, the, the, the father doesn't expect that. He is thinking for three days he can free her, but she remains 16 days in this channel for prostitution, and then on the 16th day they can free her. So this is the story. What happened to these 16 days, she doesn't remember. She remember only, no, she doesn't remember anything, but she remembers a conversation between the father and the policeman when the father comes to free her, and the policeman tells her, you have to take, her, take care now of her, there are 62 people. This, you remember, 62 people, nothing else. And this woman, uh, it's a uh, young, it, this happened um, when she told the story to me, it was like um, last year, and the story happened 12 years ago. I'm telling this now because first it's, it's a, it's a it's a, uh, she, when she told the story, the two people who listened to the story were people whose fathers were killed by the state security in the past. So actually their fathers have been victims, but the, the persons by themselves didn't experience violence. So we have here the daughter of somebody who experienced extreme violence and is now present here, lives in our society. Um, the, the interesting thing was here that the way, actually the way she was telling the story, uh, she, um, her mother forbid her to tell the story. You shouldn't tell the story to anyone, not at all, because it's a shame. You have to go first to therapy, to this, to this. You have to be so. She and she had, she hated this, this, this uh, completely um, uh, no, no telling it. And what she did, we asked her, um, did you tell the story before and to whom? And the interesting thing is, she said. I'm telling the story every time when I'm in the bus and near me is somebody sitting whom I hate. 
And if somebody, some boring lady that starts saying, oh, life is this and that, and she says, stop, you don't know what happened to me, and she tells it, and then everybody's frightened. Oh, she was raped, you know, it's like, and she, she used this story actually to make people uh, to leave her in peace. Oh, she was raped, oh, she was raped. And she even went to a writing seminar and told, told the story again. And of course, everybody in the seminar said, oh, how excited he was raped, you know? It was exactly this excitement with violence. Oh, he was raped, how many times do you know? What happened to you? And, and, and write a book, we will publish a book for you, write it. And then she was telling this to us, and then suddenly we asked her, but um, why you tell this, you know? Like, look, now for the first time you feel empathy for what you, what you are telling. Is, is it a different feeling for you when you tell it? Why, why you need to tell this story? And then we started, uh, you know, it was a point of departure when she was really, in order to do something against her mother, going into the other opposite, telling it to everybody and even publishing it to, to fulfill a kind of, and she was not free of this trauma, of course. And this was a point when I, I, I knew that it's a very important, this story, for my narration also, because it's the first story that I heard for somebody whose father is in the power and the daughter is completely, uh, it, it suffers violence. It, it was a very important narrative to show the complex of the issue, being a child of somebody working in this apparatus. It, it's, it opens completely another narration and another thinking, what happens in our society actually, and how, what, what we are today. <laughs> but I decided not to use the story. And I told her, think about this. If you want to tell this story, if you write the book, are you ready for this? Is it safe for you? And why you need to tell the story again and again? Maybe it's good to stop. Maybe it's good to remember. Maybe it's good to find the way, not, not, not to tell it, not, but to find the way what is good for you. And this is the dilemma that I'm facing. I'm also excited by the story because it's completely new narrative and a new story coming to me, which is absolutely other dimension of the, of the whole topic. But what am I doing with this story? And this is something that, 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 this is my point of departure, what is safe and when truth is healing. Because for her, telling the truth, and actually she still doesn't remember the whole truth, but repeating the truth is not a healing. She's in the trauma again, and again, and actually is forced, because of the excitement of everybody, to return to it and not to go out of it. So this is the responsibility that, and this is the safety. What means safety? And actually for the first time, she felt empathy. That somebody is empathizing and saying, oh, it's a tragedy what you experienced. It's not exciting, it's a tragedy. And I feel pity. I'm very sad. I would cry now with you together because it's shame what happened to you. And you don't deserve it. And it is the point where you can really stop. I stopped with this research at this point. And we need time. I need time to reflect what I'm doing with this. And she needs to feel this, that it's not about collecting, 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 going on. No, it's something that is absolutely on the verge of possibility. So, that's it. I, I'm still wondering if others at the table have had times where they felt they, could, they were reluctant either to write a story or to tell somebody else's story. Because certainly, I think what you have in common with all of these, whether it's in a personal narrative in your family or uh, uh, a, a, a public tragedy in Bulgaria or in Rwanda, that there is power to it. And the power, the power can, can, it can, can you know that, it, that it's, it can have consequences for people in their lives, for better or for worse. So that's, I do kind of feel that sense of risk, coming back to the word responsibility. Uh, and there are times where I just feel ill-qualified. Maybe um, I've heard some people talk about whether you feel you're the person to tell the story, whether you have. So Catherine Boo, yes, uh, but it, maybe it takes five years. And I think she was extremely mindful of of how she handled it and how, how she told the story too. So I am wondering if there are others, and um, we only have several minutes left, but are there other uh, struggles with that power? The simple answer is yes. 
and uh, uh, there comes the complication. And what what I do think is that the I will repeat probably something that I begin with. Uh, the stories uh, are uh, telling themselves through us and through the through the people and and through the one who report or who write. Uh, and sometimes sometimes there is something inside uh, a, a story that is beyond understanding and. Uh, it could trigger uh, anyone's um, curiosity, imagination, or uh, search for uh, truth, and I totally agree. We we don't uh, we do not uh, own the truth at the end of uh, digging. Uh, it is approximation to the truth, but sometimes uh, it is terribly um, complicated. And in my personal experience as a reporter, I, by the way, I, 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 I don't treat myself as a writer. This is my first um, line. Uh, and second, I totally agree with something said yesterday by Philip, uh, that uh, at least for me, I, I, I look at myself as a recording instrument. But sometimes I will not play the sound. Uh, I will record, but I will not uh, replay. I will not put the voice uh, on. And it happened to me with the, I will not go to the details, but with a very complicated story with many people involved, uh, family, a child uh, uh, abducted by his own father, uh, rage, um, Islam, uh, Catholic monastery, uh, social system in Italy. And I definitely feel myself not prepared to deal with this story. And the, the, the main thing in when I realized that I, I have to stop thinking, if possible, about this story, is the story find me, and I realized that these people are uh, mis misunderstanding what what telling the story could do uh, so they they had some hopes that uh, revealing the story will make their situation easier but the story was completely crazy uh, and the shocking element of the whole thing is that the story was so complicated that even if I try to tell you now, and even if I'm trying to tell this story in Bulgarian, which would be, uh, of course, better, nobody would believe that this is reality. Uh, so the reality looks totally fake. And there are many documents in it, but it, it looks like a, like a crazy thing. Uh, migration is there. The father abducted Father is a Sudanese migrant with refugee status in Italy and refugee. He abducted his own child, uh, who has been put because of the um, um, somnenia, uh, somnenia. doubts about uh, of abuse inside the family uh, in a monastery. Uh, the father was uh, uh, full with anger, saying that this bloody Christian civilization of ours is mistreating this child and he's, he loves his child and there is a mistake. There were court documents, blah, blah. And he abducted the child and they went through the back uh, to the opposite side, to the opposite direction of migration. They tried to uh, go back from Italy to Bulgaria and then in Bulgaria they tried to to take this child uh, by plane to Egypt. They were stopped on the border. The, the child was put under the social care in Bulgaria. In this social care, the child was beaten by the social workers and by the, the other children there because this was the only child in this particular uh, place uh, who has been visited by his mother and the other children um, were jealous because they never saw their parents, so it's awful. And then they abducted this child for the third time. They used the smuggler network. Uh, 
on the opposite direction again, not to the Western Europe, but to the Turkish border, and they were stopped there again. And I said, I can't do anything. Uh, I, I simply lack um, mm, tools, and I'm, I, I think uh, I, I could only do harm because I could not take any point of view. And the documents, be, a bunch of documents from the Italian court here, etc., could easily uh, back up opposite hypothesis. And I'm, I'm silent. And I, I have a very good advice from a French uh, colleague, a good friend of mine. I told him, listen, help me, what should I do? I feel like a, like a shit because it's, what is this? And he told me, listen, uh, if, uh, if uh, a story comes to you uh, and somebody wants to, to you to tell the story, it's not enough. You have to, to dig for the story and this is very safe. If, if you see that uh, uh, somebody is coming to you, but of course it's not so easy. You, uh, Dimitri was talking about uh, spinning off and uh, mm, po yeah, the possible abuse of, uh, uh, of the storytelling in general. But at least I, I felt okay with this advice. So I stopped with this story and the, the child is still under the social care somewhere in Bulgaria. And I think we'll stop too. We can talk more later. Thank you.